Mere revenge is too soft. They deserve judgment. Two years ago, Nagare Mari, current age, 35. Suddenly, a boy bursts through the door, cheerfully wishing his mom good morning and startling her. As she drops her seaweed in surprise, he quickly apologizes for the sudden entrance. He gently reassures her, saying there's no need for such an early morning fuss. Nagare Kiritaka, currently second year in middle school, listens as his flustered mom expresses worry over his bento being too bland and possibly causing teasing. He smiles, reassuring her that she worries unnecessarily. Her bentos are the tastiest in the world, he insists, urging her to have more confidence. His words leave her speechless. With an angelic smile, she resumes packing his bento, her eyes filled with admiration for her only son. At St. Spring High School, a foot aggressively stomps on Kiritaka, whom has a belly on his target. The culprit celebrates, Bullseye! I win! He addresses his group, offering to treat them later. The fat one asks if he can have some again, to which the girl questions the amount of sweet this fat ass needs. This makes him ask if she is calling him fat. Ajiki Mota, currently second year of middle school. The chick mocks Ajiki back. Shikimi Komiro, currently second year of middle school. The blonde one threatens to slap the both of them if they start fighting. Kinugawa Tsuyoshi, currently second year of middle school. The fourth one exclaims at his phone, surprised at the fact that a picture got sold as well. Kowase Tsubasa, currently second year of middle school. Kinugawa calls Kawase a perv. Kiritaka pisses himself, which spills towards Kinugawa. Reacting immediately, Kinugawa kicks Kiritaka and then directs his anger towards the boy as he indignantly questions the cost of his ruined footwear as he kicks him again. His homies react with very degrees of shock, a casual remark about Kinugawa's quick tempers. A dark-haired boy smirks as he joins Kinugawa, chiding him for ignoring a request not to hit the face. Sweat beads on Kinugawa's face, stuttering as he addresses Okaya. Sure I did, didn't I? Says Okaya while tapping his pinky on his shoulder. Kinugawa admits his wrongdoing, and Okaya acknowledges him. However, the next time he pulls a stunt like this, they won't be friends anymore. Okaya Nozomo, currently in my second year of middle school. Kinugawa nervously acknowledges the gravity of the situation with a single word of understanding. Okaya then notices something on the ground as he points out Kiritaka's bento box. He kicks it towards Kiritaka while making a comment about character bentos feeling dirty. He stomps on the bento ducky, stating that that's the best way of getting rid of them. Okiya offers the bento box, now swarming with cockroaches. Kiritaka's eyes widen with a concoction of surprise and disgust. Okiya presents some facts about the pest's breeding habits, conjuring a horrifying image of endless reproduction. Kiritaka repulsed, grasping at the truth of his situation. It's an invasion, relentless and personal. And it's just the beginning. Okiya menacingly towers over Kiritaka, offering a harrowing choice to become the mother of the scuttling pests. Panic sets in, eyes widen with fear. A tear-streaked face pleads for rescue through a phone screen. Desperation escalates as a horrified shout fills the air, rejecting the vile proposition. Meanwhile, Okiya's friends watch and record it in amusement as Okiya shoves the eggs inside of Kiritaka's mouth. Inside of Kiritaka's mouth. Kiritaka, now alone, collects the pieces of scattered food on the floor. With tears in his eyes, he gently takes a bite. In the school hallway, Kurimo points out how glad she is that their middle school and high school are integrated, which means that Okia is going to use Kiritaka for the next five years, to which Tsubasa comments that Kiritaka is almost tamed. Kurimi then points out that even if Okia leaves Kiritaka alone, he's not going to become his enemy anyways, which makes her question why Okia would go out of his way to crush him. In a cramped bathroom stall, a tension-filled game is underway. A boy with glasses gripped with a rope around his neck, Ajiki exclaims that the person who gets the closest number to when he gives up will all get the sweets. Kinugawa threatens the boy that he'll eliminate him if he can't do it above 10 seconds. Kurimo throws some words of encouragement towards being alpha. Okuya then tells the boy not to make that face as he reminds him that they're just playing. Kirugawa shakes a quick moment with Onright before the rope sending the boy flying as he chokes. The boy shouts in defeat, pissing off Kunigawa, who points out the amount of effort putting into prepping up the game as he yells at him to try harder. 
Stop! Kiritaka suddenly barges in, ruining the game for the bullies. Okaya inquires with a sly smile if the Kiritaka wants to trade places with the other kid, as the two share an unbalanced stare down. Back to the present, Okaya simply states that it's because he doesn't like the look in Kiritaka's eyes. Alone, Kiritaka stands in front of his apartment door as he hesitates to enter. He abruptly opens the door and exclaims, I'm home! Happy birthday, Kirikun! Oh dear, what is that wound? Kiritaka grins, recounting a stumble at school, while his mother, alarmed, insists on treating the scrape, cautioning infection. With her insistence, he complies, curiosity piqued by her past dream of nursing. She then recounts her past of being bullied and orphaned, with no family to rely on. Finding solace in a caring school nurse who gave her a place to belong, she points out that that's why she actually does have the qualifications to being a nursing teacher. He questions his mom's career change, struggling with a pack of tissues. In an intimate moment, she leans forward, touching his face tenderly as she tells him that it's because she had received a family member that she wanted to protect above anything else. Kiritaka thought to himself, Me too. I want to protect my mother's smile. Kiritaka is hiding something? He's already in middle school, he's obviously got to have some privacy, said someone over the phone with Mari. She agrees, however she thinks that there's something wrong. She feels like he's forcing himself to be a good kid. The person on the other end asks her if she isn't being a little too overprotective. Nagare Taichiro, current age, 39. Busy with work, Taichiro hangs up on the call, leaving Mari worried. Kiritaka, now in his bed as he ponders about how sweet his mother really is, and that she's definitely going to storm into school if she finds out about the bullying, and how it's going to get worse if that happens. As he is playing a video game on his phone, he gets a notification. A video file has been sent to you, by Koase. The screen shocks him. His mother appears different, playful, beckoning with a silent message. Doubt crosses his mind as he receives another message, urging him to visit the observatory. A heavy gaze locked on his phone as he starts making his way out worry on his face as he takes a good look at his mother sleeping in bed, her back to the world as he takes his leave, waking her up in the process. Kiritaka shows up to the observatory. Okaya points out how he had seen Kiritaka's mother when she was there during the class observation day. She looked so timid, he feels like he could mess with her at any time. The group laugh as they mock his mother one by one. Suddenly, fury erupts from Kiritaka as he screams for silence, unable to contain his anger. The collective laughter ceases when Okaya interjects with a calm, Hey. He demands that he changes his expression. Kiritaka recoils, sweat glistening on his face. Eyes downcast, Okaya queries when Kiritaka will acknowledge his position. Kiritaka looks on, wide eyes and anxiousness as he falls to the ground. Okaya holds a phone, a sense of satisfaction with Kiritaka's behavior. He teases about sharing a video, phone screen aglow with a video of Kiritaka's naked mother as he tells him that he should be the one spreading that video. Kiritaka, now defeated after seeing his own mother in a way that no son should ever. Okaya, annoyed, makes the request that if Kiritaka jumps off the cliff, he'll delete the video for him. Confused, he asks if he won't die. Okaya reassures him that he'll just get a few broken bones from that height. Extending a hand to Kiritaka, urging him to go ahead, jump. He suggests that he leaves his shoes there, letting him know that he wants to go down the mountains with him later. As he gets closer, he states that he will upload the video if he doesn't jump in three seconds. Three, two, one. On a map app, Maria is looking for Kiritaka. She wonders what he is doing in the mountains in the middle of winter. Something then catches her attention, changing her demeanor to absolute terror. Her son was lying down on the pavement, with his legs crushed. Mari let out a gut-wrenching scream. With tears in his eyes, Kiritaka tries to call out for his mom right before... A truck comes crushing the boy to pieces. Under a heavy downpour, she dashes forward, her outstretched hand barely missing the truck. With the truck roaring away, her missed opportunity is almost tangible in the wet air. She dashes, her cries of, No! trailing behind her as she runs. Panic distorts her face, eyes wide with worry. On her knees, she reaches out desperately, imploring for her son to come back. 
No! The group of bullies huddles in panic, their eyes wide. One suggests fleeing while another rejects the idea, fear of consequences holding them back. Kinugawa calls for a hasty retreat, urgency in the command. However, Okuya watches down at the mother holding her son's remains. Okuya lets out a sigh before admitting that he had let him win and escape as he stares at the crying mother. In the still of the night, Mari clutches a letter from a weighted heart. Her husband calls out her name. Mari. After a brief pause, he lets her know that they found a note at his shoes at the observatory. And that's why it's a suicide. No! Declined Mari as she takes the responsibility for his death, claiming that they were the ones who caused it. Taichiro, pained, apologizes for not being able to protect him. Mari wonders to herself, why didn't I realize it sooner? Did I hurt him because I was trying to love him? If the child couldn't find comfort with his parents, regardless for the reasons of his death was, aren't the parents who failed to protect the child just as guilty? Lost in thought, the string of cutting herself is barely a whisper of, ouch. The pain mirrors her inner turmoil, slicing through her just as the sharp edge does the vegetables. In Kiritaka's room, Mari is going through his stuff. She discovers his diary, her curiosity piqued. She wonders to herself if it belongs to Kirikun. Eyes wide with shock, she pauses while reading the diary. June 5th. Today, I've been hit by them again. July 20th. They stripped off my swimwear and threw me into the pool. Confusion paints her face. What is this? November 3rd. They buried my pencil case in the flower pot. December 3rd. I must denounce their harassment. I must gather as much evidence in a USB. I will hide it in my desk drawer. Mari, on a laptop, clicked on the December 3rd video. A tense negotiation occurs where Kiritaka pleads for a rabbit's life. Kinugawa demands him to add 1,000 more if he wants the rabbit to live. Mari couldn't believe her eyes as she ponders. He was forced to write this letter? She continues to watch videos of her son being bullied, beaten up and embarrassed. As she is clicking through them, she thinks that they're all demons. Koase, Ajiki, Shikimi, Kinugawa. However, they were all just fanatics. Okaya Nozumu. He is the ringleader. Regardless, Okaya is the only person left to gather evidence for. Kiritaka's final wish was that the bullying would stop soon not wanting his mom to be worried about him anymore. I must get my revenge. As Mari watches her own son eating trash, she thinks, mere revenge is too soft. They deserve judgment. Time jumps forward by two years, and students chatter excitedly about the new school nurse's attractiveness and previous globetrotting. They gossip, one student sharing an experience of unexpected kindness when confiding in her. Another student is in disbelief, unable to fathom a similar encounter with the former nurse. The new nurse's allure even earns her a divine nickname, reflecting her impact on the students, who now prefer her company over their homeroom teachers. The Maria of the Nurse Office A girl blurts out a personal question to Maria, who was caught off guard her glass of water halfway to her lips. Maria tries to avoid addressing the topic, but the girl says that she can only talk to her about this. A young boy chimes in playfully, feigning illness to engage their teacher's attention. Maria reaches out her hand and pats the startled young boy on the head. She looks up, puzzled, questioning the intention. A concern for the well-being of the petted individual is voiced, suggesting rest. Behind them, the girl tries to draw attention to their own question, only to be briskly dismissed. Okuya momentarily captures the doorway's frame, politely requesting a chat with Maria, the girl behind flustered at Okuya's presence. Maria smiles warmly, ensuring Okuya that his request is accepted. He responds with gratitude. The virgin student peeks in, uncertain if she should leave them be, and Okuya reassures her that her presence is not a bother. She hesitated a moment before accepting, nerves visible in her clenched fist and puffed cheeks. Maria then asks him, so what's the issue? He leans casually against the nurse's desk, holding some rolled up papers. Okia, a student council member, holds a poster advocating for supportive bully-free school environments. He suggests displaying it in the infirmary. She tells him that he can place it on the entrance door so that everyone can see it. He then thanks her and carefully hangs the poster, 
Maria calls Okoya admirable and points out his passion about the student council activities. With a confident grin, he deflects praise about his dedication to student council tasks, claiming it's purely for enjoyment. However, she has an addition she wants to make. The fact that he is aiming to be a psychiatrist like his father, a job that saves the hearts of others. Isn't that admirable? He confirms wanting to follow into his father's footsteps, commenting that the scars of the heart aren't visible after all. Maria calls him kind and wonders if he takes after his mother in that aspect. Having heard her referring to Okoya as Nozumu, he laughed in embarrassment as he pointed out that she knows him really well. A knowing smile graces Maria's face. She's privy to the infirmary secrets. Two years ago, the first person I've murdered was Nagare Mari. I started off by divorcing my husband, cutting off contact with my workplace and friends. I've reverted back to my maiden name in court. I've gotten full body plastic surgery to completely change my appearance. Infiltrating the school was the easiest step of them all. Mastering one art opens the path to all. A man looks intently at the woman behind his desk, who is visibly struggling. He grabs her by the hair to position himself properly for the Heimlich maneuver. Smirking confidently, the man with glasses urges her to comply. She obeys, a grin curling on her lips as she reflects on his naivety. In the bathroom, Maria leans over the sink as she pukes out. The only step left is the judgment of the lot of you. Elsewhere, a young girl wearing glasses apologizes for not being able to work at her part-time job because of cram school. This means that she can only give the person she's addressing 135 bucks this month. She pleads for forgiveness. The tension escalates as the boy kicks her in the guts. The boy mockingly brandished a phone with a video, threatening to blackmail the girl by saying if the shoplifting video goes viral, then she won't be able to get into any university. Koese Subasa, high school second year. He punches the girl in the guts while yelling at her to bring 200 bucks a month. He takes a picture of her while she pukes. Maria innocently barges in asking about their activities. Caught off guard, his voice betrays surprise and recognition. Koese then claims that Yuhana puked, so he's trying to comfort her. Maria, in distress, offers Yajima to come into the infirmary. Koese then threatens to spread the video if she snitches, not just the shoplifting video. She knows what video he's talking about. Yajime claims that she is fine. However, Maria grabs her hand and offers a place for Yajima to come next time this happens. The infirmary is a place for children like her. Kawase asks Yajima if Maria found out, but then she tells them that she almost forgot something. While holding Kawase's phone, she claims that she'll return it after class. The school rules clearly state that you cannot turn on your phone while you're in school. She then leaves with a smile on her face. On the school rooftops, Shikimi smirks, relishing the near miss they had with Maria. Kinugawa, with a furred brow, issues a stern warning to keep things quiet. Ajiki, still fat, points out that he doesn't want to go to prison because of this. Kawase nervously dismisses it, pointing out how they didn't even find out about Kiritaka's death two years ago. Okoya asks, what's wrong? Okoya questions Kawase if he's talking about Kiritaka. Kawase nervously starts to apologize, stating that he didn't mean to. Okoya lets him know that he should be the one apologizing, recalling a name he'd rather forget, fixating on a pair of defiant eyes that seemed etched into his memory. Kawase interrupts his thoughts, offering a friendship gift with an upbeat report of his own well-being. A door slams shut, the sound resonating throughout. Kawase holding a couple of bills. Shitake teases Kawase, and Ajiki warns about the misstep. Kawase's body trembles as he recalls a memory. As Kawase is bullying Kiritaka, he demands him to remember that if he can't steal from his parents, that he's going to confiscate his pocket money, hoping to make Okuya happy with it. However, Kiritaka tells him not to bother, even if he pays tribute to Okaya, he won't even care about him, reminding Kawase that he knows better than anyone else. Back to the present day, Kawase is extremely upset about the fact that he is getting embarrassed by Kiritaka, even after he's dead. An unlocked phone screen lays next to a laptop. On the laptop, an email addressed to Akeboshi Sensei reads, I'm sorry for the sudden anonymous mail. My boyfriend refuses to put on a condom during intercourse. If I tell him that I don't want it raw, he gets very disappointed. What should I do so that he will put it on next time? Maria starts typing back a reply. Thank you for contacting me, even though you're frightened. I don't think your boyfriend is doing it consciously. However, this is a case of coercive persuasion and intimidation in accordance with the criminal law. He is implanting feelings of guilt in you while making you believe that he will take responsibility if something actually happens in the future. However, if you still want to be with him, 
She stops writing and closes the window. She opens a newer window, different one this time. This causes a ping on the phone. Second year, class C. Attendance number five, Kawase Subasa. Numerous minor offenses as well as acts of voyeurism have been confirmed. A criminal that takes sexually explicit shots of individuals to be used as blackmailing material to conduct extortion. He only targets quiet and docile female students who don't seem like they would retaliate. A vile and cowardly demon. Maria, as she watches the video, she recalls Kawase's words. You don't want me spreading the shoplifting video now, do you? She pictures her own son crying. She stops for a moment, then goes right back to typing. After a while, she finally finishes typing. She undresses herself and drops on the floor. In a room filled with memories, Maria mourns her dead child. She pictures herself holding him in her arms. She whispers his name with a heartfelt softness. Clutching a framed picture of Kiritaka to her chest, she's made a promise, a determined whisper to give her all. Kawase is in his room, counting his money. He thinks about how Yajime brings him more money every time he messes with her. Then, he receives a notification on his phone. He reaches out in wonder. Who's this? What time do they think it is? An explicit video on Kawase pleasing himself. I'm always watching you. Kawase is leaping powerfully as he wonders, who is it? A girl with long hair is taking pictures with another one with short hair points excitedly. Look, it's really in full bloom. The girl with long hair replies, it's almost time for them to wither. I'll take a few pictures as well. A group of three students were taking a group selfie. Kawase solemnly thinks, who? He is wondering, who was the one who took my video? Two videos were sent to me yesterday. The master video that was taken by hacking my phone camera and a video of Nagare Kiritaka that was supposedly deleted two years ago. A blackmailing text that was sent along with the videos. A text message was sent to Kawase. If you don't want these uploaded, prepare 3 million yen, which is about 21,000 US dollars. He thinks, there's no way I can pay 3 million yen. I've already used up most of the money I've earned. But if I don't pay up, my life will be fucking over. A student asks his friend if he wants to go to the game center after class. His friend agrees, suggesting that they meet up in front of the school gate after class. Meanwhile, a girl is taking pictures, thinking that the Sakuras here are really pretty as well. Kawase ponders, that's not all. An upskirt picture is being taken of a couple girls laughing. Kawase, the pervert culprit, thinks that they're practically begging me to take these photos by wearing those short skirts. He thinks to himself that he'd put them to good use. As he sends the picture to an anonymous person, that person replies, it's another masterpiece this time. Is it possible to request elementary school girls next time? I'll pay 30,000 yen for it. Kawase types back. It's possible since we have an elementary school section as well. Kawase, with a panic expression, sweats profusely as Okiya leans forward, snatching his phone away from him, telling him, you're not allowed to use phones in school. Kawase, with a surprised look, turns to look behind as Okiya utters, hmm. He smirks, resting his chin on his hand, as Kawase looks down with a defeated expression, lamenting, I'm finished. Okiya points out that Kawase is really good at making money. He asks him if he wants to hang out after school. Kawase is in a state of negation, not wanting to be abandoned. He is currently being watched by Maria as she looks at him from the front window. Maria reflects on her actions, revealing the bluff with a 3 million yen and the removal of a hacking app from a confiscated phone. She contemplates the option of enforcing a social death on him and mentions the abundance of evidence left by Kawase. As she clenches her fist on the curtains, she determines that such actions would only amount to mere revenge. The condemnation starts now. Something catches her attention as she is watching Kawase. A boy that looks just like Kiritaka. A girl opens the door as she excuses herself. She asks if she is interrupting her. Maria slightly tilts her head and responds, Of course not. As Maria is putting the girl in bed, she inquires if the pillow is too high for her. She replies that it's all right. Maria points out that Yajime is a child with perfect attendance like her, and they tend to push themselves too hard. This surprises Yajime that Maria knows something like that. Maria replies, Well, the nurse at the infirmary tends to know much more than people think, which is why you can talk to me about anything. Yajime buries her head into her blanket. She says that there was a shoplifting attempt once pretending to talk about a friend of hers. 
She adds, However, she was caught in the action by a bad person and was made to do horrible things. She puts up with it because she thinks she's just reaping what she sowed. She then asks, What do you think she should do about it? Maria replies, There isn't a need to give in, surprising Yajime in the process. Maria stands still with her head bowed, contemplating as she utters, However, if it's too much, you can always run to me. I will protect you at all costs. This is what Maria would like Yajime's supposed friend to know. She then asks if she can pass the message, to which Yajime confirms with a soft yes. Maria watches her as she starts to cry, reminding her of Kiritaka. Later that day, while Kawase is looking for the culprit, he sees Yajima. As he approaches her from behind, he gets an idea, so he calls for her name, startling her in the process. He tells her that he's a little irritated right now, and demands her to come and comfort him. Yajima recalls Maria's words, If it's too much, you can always run to me. I will protect you at all costs. Kawase expresses surprise as Yajime runs away, prompting the question, Why? Kawase contemplates, puzzled about the girl's unusual behavior, saying she usually just trembles and freezes on the spot. Why did she only start running away today? Why? As Yajime is running fast as she can, Kawase grabs her from the shoulder. While threatening her with a box knife, he asks her if she is the culprit. At Kawase's residence, water splashes can be heard, as Kawase himself is shouting. While gripping a phone, he shouts, Why aren't my videos on your phone? Yajime replies that she's been trying to tell him that she doesn't know anything. Kawase states that she's the only one who hates him this much, as she shouts, Where is my video? A crying Yajime pleads, declaring, I've been telling you I don't know anything, upsetting Kawase, making him recoil. He retorts with, What the fuck is wrong with you? Do you want me to spread the sexy video in addition to the shoplifting video as well? She shouts back, If you want to upload it, go ahead. I will tell everyone what you did to me in return. Kawase, with a shocked expression, asks, Are you trying to expose yourself? How stupid are you, woman? While showing her the phone, he pushes her, reminding her of her further studies, her employment. They'll all be gone with just the video. He asks if she isn't scared. Yajime is kneeling with her head down and states, I am. That's why I've been putting up with it. However, it's scary to keep putting up with your demands. She pleads with Kawase to get out of her life. In a fit of anger, Kawase starts drowning Yajime, demanding her to shut up. As Kawase keeps on going, he starts recalling a memory of Okia calmly saying, If you went back to how you were, I can go back to how things were before as well. Kawase shouts at Yajime to go back to what she was like before. Yajime, as she's being drowned, cries out for help from Maria. Kawase gets yoinked out of the room, finding Maria clutching his neck tightly. She gives him a look of disgust as she injects him with an unknown substance. Yajima gets her head out of the bathwater, coughing twice. She looks to the side, then behind her, to only find darkness. Kawase wakes up, water dripping from his face, and wonders, What? I was just... dreaming? Followed by a cough, he laughs, then guesses that that must be it. Yajime would never go against him like that, and Maria would never make such a scary face, too. A cleaver swings out of nowhere, terrifying Kawase. He glances and sees a woman with long, black hair. Welcome to the penitentiary, second year, Class C. Kawase Tsubaki-kun. Kawase is looking from indoors towards a window and calls out Maria. Water then starts dropping down, confusing the boy, as he can't believe the situation that he's in. The start and the beginning of the condemnation. It's time to begin. Hell on both sides of the door. Kose, with an unsure expression slightly frowning and tilting his head, asks, Ah, is this some kind of prank? Someone asked you to do this, right? Even if you're nice to everyone, you shouldn't have accepted the request to do something like this. <sighs> Maria, with a serious expression, appears calm and collected, not replying back. Kose comes to the realization that this isn't it. This woman is serious. Maria declares, This is a punishment. To which Kawase questions, Why punishment? Maria accuses him with, 
You have stolen something important from other people. That is why. I will steal your oxygen from you. The water starts dropping quicker. Koase panics. Maria tells him it's pointless. Koase tries to tell her that it's a misunderstanding and that Yajime must have told her that he bullies her, but they were just fooling around. He admits that he might have gone a little too far because she didn't put up much of a resistance, but if she really disliked it, she wouldn't have made it a bigger deal, and that it's evidence that she didn't fight back because it's not such a big deal. Maria kicks his cage. She demands him to shut his mouth. After a brief stare down, she points out that regardless which is a penitentiary, there is a path for his redemption. She points out his cuffs, stating, the greatest crime you've ever committed. By entering the number that represents it, you will be set free. He can just escape from the ceiling after that. However, if he's a fool and can't even manage that, he must offer his blood as penance for his sins. He quickly starts to put numbers on the cuffs, demanding to not be messed with, as these choices don't make sense to him. He thinks that she has no intention of letting him choose in the first place. He wonders what his greatest sin is. Underage explicit movies? Blackmailing? He wonders what she even means by the number that represents it. He assumes that he must try every single combination until he understands it. 0001 0002 000 In a fit of rage, he slams the water, shouting, There's no time for something like that! As he stands in rising water, expressing surprise that the water is already at their hips. In a panicked tone, he gives apologies to Maria multiple times and pleads for help. Maria gives him the coldest look ever, frightening him. Koase, covering his face with his hand and crying, saying, <laughs> It's unreasonable! And, This is too horrible! Recalling his friends, pleading, Everyone, please help me! I want to hang out with everyone else a little more! Koase recalls Nagare Kiritaka. He freezes for a moment before turning back. Maria, staring at him menacingly as he looks from worry to determination. He thinks the numbers are four digits. He states, The death anniversary of Nagare Kiritaka. As he starts to input numbers into the lock, he thinks, I don't know how that hag knows about Nagare, but I can't give a shit about it now. The most important thing to do now is escape from here. If I can escape from here, there's no way I would have any trouble against a single woman. The death anniversary of Nagare is... Uh, when did Nagare die again? I, I'm pretty sure it was some cold. Uh, January. February. In anger, he shouts Nagare's name, wishing that he could have died on some kind of holiday as he is drowning. He tries to hang on, looking at the cleaver from earlier while Maria watches. She smiles, terrifying him. He looks at the cleaver again. After all hopes have been cut off, the next thing to be cut off is... As Kawase is trying to chop his own hand off, he screams and screams. But the coward isn't able to cut off his own hand. He tells Maria that he doesn't know the date of Nagare's death. Maria draws to the simple conclusion. I guess you'll have to die then. Kawase starts to drown, his eyes locked on his hand. He wonders, I'm going to die. He uses the cleaver to chop off his own hand as he thinks that there is no way he is going to die. As he is slicing his hand off, he thinks that he is a person acknowledged by Okaya, not being able to afford to die there, wanting to go to university and enjoy his life, wanting to earn a bunch of money from stupid girls and becoming filthy rich, destined to have a good life. He stops slicing upon realizing that the bone is hard. As he starts slicing harder, he wishes for his bone to break. But in return, the cleaver breaks. Koase's vision starts to fade as he recalls Maria labeling her a devil. Some time later, Koase's case is empty of water and covered in blood. Maria opens the door and unlocks his hand. She states that his greatest sin wasn't driving that boy to his death. It was the fact that he was born. Maria sits down as she watches Koase's body burn. Her expression is one of exhaustion. Behind her, a bunch of bloody tools in the gas tank. While watching the flames, a memory of her from her past sparks. Maria shivers. She takes deep breaths and coughs, sobbing at her past memories. She bites her lip right before slumping. She states, 
far to go. At Saint Spring High School, two girls are conversing about Kawase not coming to school for over two weeks, wondering where he went. The short-haired student replies that apparently the police got involved as well, surprising the other one as she wonders if there's an article about it on the internet. On someone's phone, they tried to call Kawase, but were getting no answers. Okaya, with a worried yet nonchalant demeanor, gets asked by a mysterious man if he is Okaya Nozumu. Nagare Taichiro, a detective from the Public Safety Department, requests to speak with him about the disappearance of Kowase. A fate brought forth the encounter of the two. The detective informs Okaya that the school had also mentioned that there wasn't anything unusual going on with Kawase, to which Okaya replies, This is also why we have no idea where he suddenly went. Okaya bows, pleading with the detective to help him find Kawase. The detective reassures him, stating that that's his job anyways. He adds that they were the classmates of his son, which is why he can't see this as just another case. Okaya inquires about the name of the detective's son, Nagare Kiritaka. Okaya, with a gentle look in his eyes and a slight frown pictured from the chest up, he says, This was truly an unfortunate incident. The detective, taken aback, compliments Okaya by calling him really kind. Happy to have his son being remembered, he holds his hands close to his chest and says that after divorcing his wife, he never managed to have a conversation about him anymore. At a restaurant, Shikimi complains that Okaya is not coming, while the chubby one complains about the fries. Kinugawa complains about the two of them, and he asks them about what happened with Koase. Shikimi doesn't give a single crap about him, calling him creepy. She asks Kinugawa to forget about him, and asks him to think about the good birthday presents for Okaya. Kinugawa, pissed off, reminds Shikimi that Koase is their friend. Shikimi nonchalantly tells him that there is no need to get pissed off, calling him annoying. Shikimi gets a notification on her phone. She gets up and leaves. Kinugawa asks where she is going, and she replies, At a hotel, Shikimi is sitting intimately with a grown man. He informs her that this is the first time that he's gotten matches with such a kind and pretty girl, and that's why, when he first got matches with her, he thought she was just another bad girl. She teases him, calling him mean and asking if she really is a good girl. He confirms pointing out that she doesn't order the most expensive menu during meals, or fiddle with her smartphone when they talk. In surprise, she asks if there really are a crappy woman like that, and she suggests to him that he should have just walked out on them. He smiles and compliments her kindness. She presses her hand on his face, which takes him aback. Shikimi seductively remarks that he had always been suffering in terrible relationships. And now that they're together, it's all over. She gets closer to him, and he starts to cry. The two get interrupted by the doorbell. Shikimi guesses that it's room service, to which the man asks if she ordered something. Upon opening the door, the man gets startled by a gangster-looking guy. He laughs at him, calling him a funny uncle. The man then questions the identity of the guy. He replies by shutting his mouth with his own hand. He asks him if he was planning to have intercourse with a high school student. The man says that she is a 22-year-old girl, to which she apologizes and says that he simply looked so easy. She baited him. She asks him that since he was able to have so much fun with a girl like her, a trillion yen isn't too much. That's about seven billion dollars. The man, knowing he isn't Elon Musk, starts to cry. In the bathtub, Shikimi is listening to music while the man is getting tortured. She is looking at some dresses on her phone, shopping for one. She then starts to daydream. Okaya, complimenting her outfit while romantically holding her in his arms. Shikimi wiggles in the bath in excitement, while the man accepts to pay the money and offers to take it from his company. Well, I guess he is Elon Musk after all. At the nurse's office, a man in sportswear is asking Maria if Kawase didn't confide in her, thinking that he would approach her for counseling if he was to run away from home. Maria apologizes for not being able to help. The man reassures her, as this is his responsibility, since he is his homeroom teacher in the first place. He adds that this has only happened because he didn't pay extra attention to him. Maria, a sweet angel, reassures the teacher, telling him with determination that Kawase will come back. This takes the teacher aback, apologizing as he realizes that she must be probably feeling worried as well. She negates him, stating it's probably worse for him. She then gets into the topic of worries, wanting to tell him something about Shikimi that is in his class. There seems to be some unsettling rumors that she's heard about her. Maria knows everything. Shikimi, visibly upset, approaches Kinugawa who asks her, what's wrong? She bangs on the wall. 
As she bangs on the wall, she asks if they are the culprits who snitched about her side job. Kinugawa asks what she's talking about, to which she tells him now to act dumb. Her homeroom teacher called her out on it, telling her that someone saw her walking with a man in the Love Street Hotel, while she was trying to innocently deny the accusations. Her homeroom teacher says that if it wasn't true then it's okay, to which she shouts that it's not okay demanding information about the person that said such things, directing attention at the fact that the two of them are the only ones who know about it. Kinugawa puffing smoke at her nonchalantly tells her that he's so dumbfounded that he can't even get mad. The chubby one points out that if someone just saw her, that it could be anyone. Surprised, she states that she had used the hotel somewhere far away. Kinugawa grabs her from the thigh and brings her closer to him. Gripping her thigh tightly, he demands her, Stop suspecting your friends. Shikimi, annoyed, slaps his hand away. As she walks away, she angrily tells him that they're no longer friends if they tell Okuya about it. In the meantime, Maria overheard everything, thinking that it's going well. I've already done my investigation on the fact that you were conducting badger games for pocket money. If I were to pressure and comfort you with the fact via your homeroom teacher, your personality will cause you to be suspicious of your friends too, and thus, creating a rift between your bonds. This is a sneaky and cowardly way to go about it. However, this is what you've done to Kirigun in the past. Second year C class, Shikima Kurumi. In a flashback, Shikimi worryingly says aloud that she can't find her gym clothes. Kinugawa teases her by saying that it probably got stolen, to which she angrily replies that whoever would do that is disgusting. Kiritaka, while looking into his bag, finds Shikimi's clothes. She passes by him and he drops his head down. The snake smiles. She leans down and asks him, Why do you have it, Nagare? Kinugawa grabs the boy, telling him that the gym clothes can't possibly move themselves, while Shikimi calls him disgusting as she smiles. Kiritaka shouts that he doesn't know anything about this and that he didn't do it. Shikimi, in return, turns to the class asking them to raise their hands if they believe if he didn't do it. No one even reacts, in the slightest. Shikimi whispers into Kiritaka's ear that apparently no one believes him. In his journal, he states that there must be people who knew that I wasn't the culprit and that no one believed me, because there isn't any value in trying to help me. That was the day where I felt I was alone in this. Maria. Reassuring her son opens her closet. That loneliness you've experienced, I will make her go down the same path. You can't escape once you've been caught. At the school rooftop, Okuya stands tall as he apologizes for gathering his supposed friends there. Shikimi simps by reassuring him that he can call her anytime. Kinugawa, on the other hand, asks what's wrong. Okuya points out that it has been three weeks since Koese has gone missing. The police haven't gotten any leads on the case, and he guesses that they are in the same fog. Kinugawa conforms. He adds that Kawase didn't have any other friends than them, and that no one knew when they last saw him. Fat Ass agreed. Shikimi assumes that they must have gone on a trip, and that's why Okuya shouldn't have been worried about it. Kinugawa pointed out that if he went on a trip, he would have said something in advance. Pissing off Shikimi, she shouts that he might have had an accident in the mountains or something. Fatass informs her that Kawase doesn't have any interest in outdoor activities in the first place. Shikimi turns at him demanding what he even has to do to take Kinugawa's side as well, to which he replies that he isn't even taking side and that he's just telling the truth. He adds that Shikimi has been acting way too hysterically recently. She insults him back and BAM! The group flinches. Okuya calmly deduces that Kawase might have been killed, putting the three at unease. Except Fatty, he's too busy eating. With a charming smile, Okuya points out that it's just a possibility, and maybe it's just as Shikimi said. Koese might have an interest in outdoor activities and that it doesn't hurt to be careful. There might be a lunatic that is coming after them because of some unjustified resentment. He groups them up before warning them that that's why they must be careful. In class, Shikimi is simping over Okuya again. She then realizes something. Her gym clothes are missing. She asks the class if anyone has seen her gym clothes to which Kinugawa answers that she's so noisy and should hurry up and get the heck out. They can't change when she's still there. Shikimi throws her bag at him, demanding him to find it out for her. This behavior annoys Kinugawa, when then they noticed something. Shikimi's gym shirt on the ground. Upon seeing it, she gets disgusted by it. She demands Kinugawa not to set her up in such an obvious way. She accuses him of being the one who stole it, to which he clearly doesn't give a damn. He hands her the shirt, demanding her to stop this stupid shit. Shikimi, in a panic, denies. She asks him why he is making it as if she is the one who set him up, accusing him of stealing it once again, to which he denies. She asks them why it was in his backpack. 
He blames it on her and she denies it, asking why she would put her clothes in his stinky backpack and that she doesn't have anything to gain from that. Kinugawa kicks the chair in a fit of anger, which hits a random dude in class. He then grabs Shikimi by the shirt and he shouts, It's the same shit that happened to Nagare. The two then come to a realization. Time freezes. Shikimi looks back at her classmates. The two look away, avoiding her gaze. Shikimi stumbles in her words, uttering nonsense. She tries to find a time where Kinugawa had a chance to put her gym clothes in his bag, to which he answers that he simply went to the toilet. She turns towards the class, asking if anyone can be his witness. Raise your hand. Someone does so. And that person is... Maria. She informs her that he didn't steal it. Okinawa was with her the whole time. So what happened? An hour ago, as Kinugawa is heading out of class, Maria stops him requesting some of his time. He denies her, telling her that he has class, but she grabs him. She recalls having seen him smoke outdoors from the infirmary yesterday. She tells him that he would be a little late to class, but he's free to speak with her. The two then walk into her office, Kinugawa annoyed and Maria cheery. Back to the present, Kinugawa informs Shikimi that he was having a consultation with Maria, so there's no way he could have stolen her stuff. Shikimi, in denial, accuses him that he could have done it after his consultation, to which he replies that they were working together all the way back before entering the cooking classroom, so there's no chance in hell. He asks her if she can just let it go, stating that there's no merit to both of them if Nagare's incident gets dut up because of this. Shikimi, now irritated, thinks, if this continues, I'll look like the perpetrator, even though I am the victim. Feeling the need to hurry as she scouts around the classroom, trying to find the real culprit, she exclaims. She points at the boy with glasses, asking, Is it you? Labeling him an otaku loner that always carries around some disgusting anime goods, pointing the finger that he looks like someone who would sniff her gym clothes. One of her classmates tries to stop her, but she keeps on pushing, asking if she is covering up for the perpetrator. She shouts that if they don't find the culprit right now, she might become the victim of the next theft. Or maybe she is saying that she doesn't want it to happen again. Losing all sense of rationality, she accuses the girl of being the real culprit. As Shikimi is pointing the finger, someone whispers, You're probably just the one stringing shit up. Shikimi, enraged, demands to be told who said that, and if they can't speak up, they should just shut it. Whispers fill the classroom. Shikima is the real culprit, right? It's the same shit that happened to Nagare. For real, though, no one would even want Shikimi's gin clothes. Her demeanor changes into confusion. The two students look away and go back to whispering. This enrages her. Maria orders everyone to stop. She states, There is no evil dance as to who the culprit is, but there isn't any evidence that Shikimi put it in his bag as well. She starts walking towards Shikimi as she inquires of them that in this case, why wouldn't they just stop suspecting each other? She grabs Shikimi from the shoulder as she is about to address her, telling her that she shouldn't suspect her friends, or else she should end up alone if this continues. Shikimi wonders, alone? Maria offers to write up a report on this in exchange that she lets this go for today. Shikimi pushes away Maria's hand. A student grabs her while Shikimi gives dangerous eyes at her. She asks the class, what? They give her a look of disgust one after another. She demands them to say something, begging them not to look at her with those creepy eyes. She storms off and Maria quickly starts walking away. She tells the class that she'll go after her and demands everyone to prepare for gym class. As Shikimi is running, she wonders, Alone? Someone like me? Anger fills her. Feelings shatter as memories cross her mind. I'm not a loner, she thinks. Maria asks her to hold on. Shikimi turns around and demands her to shut up. Maria coldly replies, You're such a pitiful child, aren't you? Walking right past her and leaving. Maria thinks to herself, To get so riled up from just that, she's still a child. After calling out Kinugawa and making him late for class, I took Shikimi's gym clothes from her bag and placed it in Kinugawa's bag. And that was all to make it look like this happened. It went a little too well. So much so, that I was getting skeptical. In a car, the gangster-looking guy asks Shikimi if she is irritated again. She doesn't reply, so he goes to comfort her. He reminds her that he has told her that Maria is just jealous of her youth and cuteness. She shyly agrees. He then recalls that there is another uncle he wants her to bait. She denies telling him that she isn't in the mood. 
He begs her, not being able to ask anyone but a cute high schooler like her to help him with this. Such a pitiful child. Shikimi understands and agrees to do it. However, she desires something in exchange. To punish Maria for her. The school principal is raising a toast, thanking the teachers for their hard work in spring. He announces that they will be heading towards a rainy season, but insists that they all work hard until summer break. And with that all said, cheers. That one teacher seems a little upset though. Maria approaches him, offering a drink. The man blushes at her charm. He apologizes for not being a drinker, to which Maria apologizes too and offers him some cooling tea instead. The teacher freezes for a while. Then Maria asks him if he is worried about Shikimi. The teacher points out that Maria sees through everything, remarking that Shikimi hasn't been to school since that incident. He informs her that he has tried doing a house call, but no one answered the intercom. He adds that Kawase is still missing, requesting some advice to fix all of this. She gives him looks of empathy. The principal barges in, all cheery and stuff, as he offers him a drink. While the principal is pouring the drink, he warns him, Our Saint Spring Academy academics are getting closer to preparatory schools in Tokyo. So I would be very troubled if there are some weird rumors going around. Do you understand? Maria enters the conversation charmingly, pointing out the lint on the principal's back, offering her tender hand to get rid of it. She then sneakily exchanges cups with the teacher, providing him with a cup of water. He gulps it in front of the principal, which impresses him. As Maria is sitting next to the principal, this pervert gropes her. The two act like nothing is going on. Maria unsettlingly looks around. Everyone looks so happy. It's like Kiritaka's incident never even happened. She then gets up and leaves. The teacher stops her in her tracks, bows and thanks her. She bows back, turns and leaves as she slightly grips her umbrella. Maria thinks to herself, Please don't thank me. I'm not the person you think I am. As she is walking home, she hears a car in the darkness. She starts walking faster, and so does the car. She walks even faster. A clanking noise catches her attention. The person asks her if she is Maria. The gangster-looking dude was accompanied by a couple of men. The main guy informs her that he had heard she was a hag, but she looks so much prettier than in her photos. She asks, Who are you? He ignores her and points out her bust. He asks for her size, or if they are fake. She turns away and leaves. A bald man blocks her way. The main guy informs her that he knows she has a day off tomorrow, and offers to enjoy her day off with them. Maria reaches into her bag and zaps the bald one. This catches them off guard as Maria starts to run away. He sighs and annoyingly states that this is because he was just being a nice guy, and she thinks she's all that. Catch her! He shouted. The two dash towards her, and she turns heading into the alleyway. One of the guys follows her, while the other one suggests him not to go alone. The guys find her bag on the floor. He laughs and thinks that she is desperate. Maria catches him by surprise and tases him. His friend flinches, and he goes in to check on him. He gets informed that she had run away, until she appears tasing him on the neck, knocking him out. She slips her taser back into her bag as she runs away. Behind her, he swings his back. Their eyes meet for a moment. He hits her on the arm and sends her flying onto the ground. He then comes closer to rub his bat on her. He slides it into her shirt. He tells her that he really hates people who show their fangs at him. He leans down to ask her the size. The interrogation from hell. Shikimi is texting the gangster, who has sent her a text letting her know that he went to punish Maria. Shikimi asks him if he is done yet. Five minutes later, she calls him and he doesn't pick up. She gets annoyed. She wants him to hurry up and respond to her. No news is good news? She thinks, Well, I guess it means that he's messing up Maria right now. She hears footsteps. Annoyed, she asks if her mom is home. She peeks her head out into the hallway and reminds her that he has told her to do the laundry before she went out. Something she sees startles her. Nobody is there, and the door is unlocked. Confused, she dashes in wondering if she had forgotten to lock the door. Maria appears behind her. Somewhere, Shikimi is tied with her mouth shut. She is instructed not to move. Maria adds that she doubts that she would be able to do so drugged. Shikimi tries to resist, while Maria smiles maniacally. Let's get this started then. She said, Second year class C. Shikimi, Kumiru. Maria takes off Shikimi's mouth cover. 
the girl instantly starts spewing out insults in the most vile and animalistic manners. In response, Maria takes out a knife and starts slicing the rope. Shikimi realizes and begs her to stop. In return, Maria calls out her name, telling her to shut up. Shikimi shuts up and Maria reassures her that she won't die even if she falls. However, this place is deep in the mountains far from any civilization. So, if she falls, she would land at the bottom of the cold, insect-infested well, and probably would have to spend her whole life there, alone. Shikimi starts to cry. Maria notices and stops slicing. She brings her back to the topic at hand. First, about those men sent by Shikimi. Maria admits that she was surprised at how easy they were as she recalls their interaction with their leader. Maria tells their leader that they're going to catch a cold if they stay there, and as he is about to say something, she goes in for a kiss. The man is seduced and falls right into the ground. Maria informs him that there is a love hotel that went out of business nearby, and offers to head there so that they can take their time with this. She thinks that he has something that he has to tell her as well. Back to the present. Shikimi is confused as Maria is telling her what happened, how the leader had just told her about the little prank she was going to play on her, calling him a low-value man. She guesses that this is why they say birds of the same feather flock together. Shikimi snaps as she insults Maria, who nonchalantly brings Kawase to the conversation, comparing the two with their lack of inkling of their own sins. Shikimi then connects the dots about Kawase's disappearance. Maria, holding a candle, firmly states, Shikimi, you led people into the depths of their loneliness. Therefore, I shall plunge you in the same pits of despair as well. She puts down the candlelight by the rope. She informs her that in three hours, the rope would catch the flame of the candle. She will plunge into darkness and live out her life in solitude. However, just like Kawase, she is granted a chance at repentance. She is allowed to contact a single person and tell them a single sentence. However, she isn't allowed to call for help, nor allowed to tell them about the circumstance. She is to act as normal as possible. Shikimi asks what it is that she really wants from her, and if it isn't too much of a disadvantage for her. Maria, with a cheeky smile, replies, I wonder. Shikimi then realizes the SIM card on the phone had been removed. She informs her that without it, she can't send anything. Maria sarcastically apologizes, claiming that she removed it while they were moving. Shikimi wonders what's on Maria's mind. Maria presents Shikimi with a box and tells her, It seems to have been mixed in with the cutler knives. Can you take it out for me? Sorry. Oops. <laughs> Shikimi, now presented with the box, gets asked by Maria if she isn't going to take the SIM card, reminding her that if she doesn't contact her friends soon, the rope will start to burn and she is going to fall. She asks her if she needs more explanation, or if she is really that stupid. Shikimi plunges her face into the box. Shikimi stares at the cutter knives in panic, as Maria hums to herself. This annoys Shikimi who starts to yell, poking her face onto one of the cutler knives. She flinches back out and starts to cry, claiming that this is the worst, wondering why this is happening to her. Maria, in disgust, demands her to stop playing the victim. We're all tired of your antics. She adds on. Your undoing is a mere reflection of your own conduct. Shikimi in disbelief as she starts to recall a memory. A box full of pins as Shikimi is sitting down holding a leash, stating that her apartment forbids dogs. Kiritaka on his knees like a dog, face buried in the box. Shikimi yoinks him as she points out something in surprise. Pochitaka-chan actually managed to get the house keys, only having trained him twice and this is what he can do. She states that maybe she has talent as a breeder. Back to the present, Shikimi asks Maria why she knows what happened, pointing out that she came to their school just this winter, and she questions who she really is. She then comes to the realization. She compares Maria with Kiritaka. She realizes that it's his mother, to which she lets her know that Kawase didn't even notice it. Shikimi realizes that this whole thing is about revenge, and if that's the case, then the person after her is. She suddenly visualizes Maria choking Okuya with a chain, with determination, she decides she must do what it takes to let Okuya know immediately. She approaches the box and closes her eyes. She starts looking around for the SIM card. She pokes and stabs herself multiple times, cutting her tongue. She flinches and blood starts spewing out of the box. She then takes her tongue out with the SIM card on it. She asks, You scared? 
Maria then grabs the SIM card off of her tongue. Shikimi then thinks about who to contact, the easiest choice being Kinugawa, since they have probably known each other since kindergarten. However, since he's sulking now, he's probably going to leave her messages unread. Ajiki goes at his own pace, so he's probably going to take his sweet time to reply to her messages. As expected, the only one that can be counted on is Okiya. She then wonders what she should message him to make him come, and since she can only send a single message, she should pick her words carefully. If she says that she wants to meet him, he'll probably just ask her for the reason and that is the end of that. She can't use the word help me, as the condition was to talk to him like she always did. She starts to read their conversation together. On April 10th, Shikimi sent, Hey, Okayakun, there's a new crepe shop that opened near the school, left on red. April 11th, Shikimi sent, Look, this video is so cute, left on red. Two hours later, she sent him a picture and said, I bought new clothes, what do you think? One day later, Okiya replied, It's nice. Shikimi comes to the realization that they've never actually had a conversation. Upon Shikimi's realization that Okiya never actually cared about her, she thinks, But if he hated me, he wouldn't have been nice to me. He even hangs out with me sometimes. And if it's Okiya, he would notice if I managed to send the correct message, including what happened to Kawase. He might even realize that these incidents are about revenge for what happened to Nagare. And once he reaches that conclusion, he wouldn't call the police and persuade Kinukawa and the rest. After that happens, Evan will surely come to save me. She then again looks at her message, as she thinks, Really? Even if I am always being left to red? She asks Okia if she likes her. The text reads, If you like me, please come here immediately. She sends it to Okia, who is currently heading out of the Shinto Cram School. He gets a notification and looks at it. A message from Shuzuka, asking him if he is going to have dinner before coming home. He replies, Yes, mother, I'll have dinner before heading home. Maria asks Shikimi why she didn't choose Okiya. She questions her furthermore, asking if she would actually rather die than realize that he doesn't like her. Shikima throws an insult at her, suggesting that she can act all high and mighty for now, as she reminds her of the guy who assaulted her might be stupid, but he never says no to money. The message reads, I am honey trapping a rich uncle on a drive date. Come now. He replies, Do what you want, you ugly bitch. Don't even show your face around me again. Shikimi is in disbelief at what happened. Maria informs her that there is a continuation to the story after she tamed that man she sent to her. At the abandoned love hotel, the puppy boy is leashed up. Maria asks him if it felt good, Ijima, to which he wonders how she even knows his name. She then shows him a phone. On Twitter, or our X now I guess, Shikimi tweeted, I got so little for my part-time work today. Ijima is so stingy, accompanied with a picture of him beating someone up. Maria asks him if it's scary. Children these days just tweet about everything. We find out that Maria had made up that account to impersonate her, though Ijima seems to believe it. Although she wanted to come in contact with him another way, thanks to Shikimi, her plans moved forward. Shikimi claims that that's cheating, questioning the reason behind these actions, to which Maria replies that it's because she knows she's a selfish liar. Compared to her friends, she believes in ties that are connected via profit. Since she's always been using lies to manipulate everyone, she doesn't believe in anyone, and no one believes in her. Maria leans closer to ask her, Have you finally realized? You're the one who's been making yourself the loner. Shikimi tells her to go and die, her demeanor of a witch as she insults Maria, stating that she has no chance of killing Okiya, and that she'll soon be where Nagare is. Mother and son, both a mess. Maria thanks her for being the devil that she is. The rope takes fire and breaks. Shikimi falls down. Her head hits the ground first as she lets out pained noises. Honey, said Maria. Oh dear, you're still conscious? I guess you landed badly. If you were unconscious, you wouldn't even be able to notice a thing while they take care of you. Shikimi starts to tremble. She lifts her head as insects start to crawl around her. One slides into her clothes, another one crawls into her ear, and inside there, it lives. She soon finds herself surrounded with hundreds of thousands of hungry insects. The voice that could no longer be heard. It's too late. Shikimi has ties with quasi-gangsters, and hence we can't deny that there is a possibility that she has been caught up in some kind of trouble due to that connection. On the other hand, 
The other missing victim, Kawase, is her classmate. There is a high possibility that both cases are connected. For those reasons, a joint investigation with us, Section 1, has been formed, said Section 1 Criminal Investigation Department Inspector, Taijo Reiji, age 41. He adds that the only thing he asks for is not to get in the way of their investigation, addressing their Inspector Nagare of the Community Safe Planning Division. The inspector's colleague points out that he still really hated as usual. The inspector answers that they didn't fire him even after hearing the rumors of him abusing his family, concluding that he is still treating them kindly. His colleague pleads with him to now make jokes that he can't laugh at, knowing how much the inspector loves his family. As the inspector looks out the window, he sees a happy family, and he states that it doesn't matter if it was never communicated. Two years ago, due to the rumors of my abuse towards the now-deceased Kiritaka, my career path has been forced into a dead end. Though the suspicions have been lifted, I'm still getting mistreated by my peers. After being transferred to this jurisdiction with the never-ending juvenile crimes in the academic city, it has caused and increased the number of days where I wasn't able to go home due to the amount of work. Regardless, I was thankful for this mistreatment. He pictures himself and his family in place of that one. His eyes. Those can't be described with words. He recalls back to when Maria wanted a divorce. He pleaded with her to wait, and she refused. He offers to try to rebuild everything, but she claimed it's impossible. He asks her if she thinks it's times like these where they should stay by each other's sides. That is what it means to be a family. Family? She asked. Even though Kirikun isn't here? She asked. The man withdrew his hand and crumbled to the ground. Maria apologizes and leaves, making him wonder. Mari, where, where are you right now? Maria is pouring a bowl of granola with non-fat milk. Before she eats, she prays, thanks for the food, with a plushie sitting in front of her representing Kiritaka. The inspector is facing the principal. He asks him if he has no idea of the rumors surrounding Shikimi. He replies that he would have given her some guidance. He turns towards Atsuki to ask him if he didn't know. The teacher struggles for a moment. He answers, I knew, shocking everyone in the room. He says, I knew, and yet I didn't stop her. If only I had paid more attention to the issue, this wouldn't have happened. The inspector can relate as he remembers doing the same thing when it came to Kiritaka. He addresses the teacher, reminding him that he can't change the past. You can only accept the pain and the regret, and continue living your life without suffering from that guilt. Everyone is at a loss for words. His colleague asked about who he had heard that rumor from. The school's nurse, Akeboshi-sensei. The inspector, having heard the name of his ex-wife, is at a surprise. In denial, he thinks, there's more than a thousand people with that surname. Convincing himself that he is overthinking this, the teacher adds on that she had also mentioned hearing the rumors from other students as well. The colleague guesses that this is all there is for today and offers to return to the station for now. The inspector agrees. However, it asks the whereabouts of Akaboshi-sensei right now. Where do you think she is?